Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our Menninger Mindscape program. I'm Dr. John Oldham, the Chief of Staff at Menninger Clinic. We have a very distinguished visitor today, Dr. Tom Costin. Welcome, Tom. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Tom uh, has a lot of titles, so I'm going to go through those because I want you to know what he does. He's the Wagoner Chair and Professor of Psychiatry, but also Professor of Neuroscience, Pharmacology, and Pathology and Immunology at Baylor College of Medicine. In psychiatry, he's Vice Chair in our Department for Research, and he's also Director of the Division of Alcohol and Addiction Psychiatry. That's not enough. In addition, he's co-director of the Dan Duncan Institute for Clinical and Translational Research. He's also a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the University of Texas MD Anderson Hospital. And finally, he's distinguished professor at Peking University School of Medicine in Peking, China. So Tom covers a lot of territory, uh, both geographically and in terms of his work and expertise. We could talk about so many things we'd be here all day, Tom. <laughs> Thank you. But one of the things you're doing, and that's partly the China connection, I think, um, is some really interesting work on trying to develop vaccines that could help prevent various kinds of drug addiction. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yes, certainly. That has been one of my enthusiasms or hobbies, I suppose, for the last 20 plus years. A little more than a hobby. Uh, I, I think so, although when I talk to the major pharmaceutical manufacturers, they consider it more as a hobby since uh, they have um, an aversion to uh, drugs of abuse as a topic that they want to pursue. Well, that's, that's, that's not, we don't have time to go into that, but that's a real challenge and problem. It's, it's it? a very big yeah. problem, and it's a problem that public health is, of course, a number one priority, you would think, but to the pharmaceutical companies, that's sometimes not so clear. Vaccines we have been working on have been uh, over a variety of substances of abuse for nicotine, for cocaine, for methamphetamine, for opiates, and all of them have uh, very distinctive places in the armamentarium that you might want to use to treat addictions. The nicotine vaccines have been the one that actually have attracted some enthusiasm from the major pharmaceutical companies, and uh, there have been now three major companies that have developed vaccines in uh, nicotine based on the early work that I did with it. So I'm going to back you up a little bit because you're talking about these as if they exist. Yes. I'm not sure everybody watching knows that these exist because they're not out there that much at this point. So nicotine already is developed and works? Well, it depends how you want to think about it. It's developed through stage three testing you know, or phase three testing in the FDA approval process. And GSK, Novartis, and Pfizer all have vaccines that they've uh, put through this kind of testing. Mm -hmm. None of them have carried it through to a new drug application for FDA approval. Okay. So they're and not available to anybody out there yet. So you cannot get them. They okay. are, okay. Like, unless you are involved in one of these studies that one of the companies will be doing. And Pfizer is the latest company that will be conducting a clinical trial within the mm -hmm. next few months. Mm -hmm. The other vaccines for cocaine, methamphetamine, and opiates have been much more uh, of interest to those of us who are funded by the National Institute of Health and have been very interested in public health. The uh, vaccines have progressed along fairly well in that the cocaine vaccine that I first developed now over 20 years ago. And, and you were the I was one the, who really developed. Uh, uh, yes, in collaboration with a company called Immulogic, which has mm -hmm. unfortunately long since gone out of business along with three other companies that I worked with <laughs> that uh, developed these vaccines. What is it about you, Tom? Uh, yes, I do have a way of putting companies out of business, so don't do business with me if you want to stay alive. Uh, but we have carried this vaccine all the way through up to phase three testing. Um, it has been relatively effective, but the problem with it has been the same problem that uh, larger companies have had with the nicotine vaccine that only about a third to a half of the patients who get the vaccine develop sufficient antibody levels to actually block the drug of abuse, mm -hmm. whether that's nicotine or cocaine. The opiate vaccines and the methamphetamine vaccines are still in animal studies and have not moved on to human studies, but we predict that we will have similar problems. The reason is relatively simple in that the thing you need to make a vaccine very powerful and to develop very high antibody levels 
is something that's not needed for most of your typical vaccines for infectious diseases, that relatively low levels of antibodies will be sufficient because when you get infections, you really don't get that many organisms in you. Mm -hmm. But in order to block drugs of abuse, you need an extremely high level of IgG, which is the antibody that mm -hmm. blocks the cocaine. You need up to one to 2% of your total IgG that your body makes. And considering that it's usually a hundredth to a thousandth that most vaccines make, we are clearly asking to make very, very high levels of difference. antibody. Yeah. So one needs something called adjuvants. Um, the adjuvants that were available to us back 25 years ago were only something called alum, which is basically aluminum. And it is reasonably effective, but since that time, many more adjuvants have been developed. They have uh, been used with some of the vaccines in influenza and they can boost the antibody response quite a bit, sometimes 10 to oh, as much as 10 times. And they also make the antibody responses last longer. Mm -hmm. So, and finally, they also bring those levels up quicker, which is what their major use has been for influenza, to bring the antibody levels up quicker, to bring them to higher levels and have them more sustained. Those are all the characteristics that we need for these addiction vaccines. Right. And we have been able, in the last year or two, to get at least two of those adjuvants, as they're called, available to us. So we've now developed a new cocaine vaccine that in the animals has raised antibody levels three to four times above the levels we got with the current vaccine that's been tested. But the reason it's taken so long to get to this point is because of the need to develop this adjuvant, or is it more rules and regulations that get in the way, or maybe both? Um, it's more rules, regulations that get in the way, and the fact that we have very limited funds to work with, that we have to write grants sure. to get them. Sure. Most uh, large pharmaceutical companies that will develop a medication or a vaccine will take usually about 15 years to develop it and spend upwards of a billion dollars wow. on the development. Wow. We have spent something of the order of about Ten million dollars, um, and have been at a moving at a pace a little slower than major pharma, but not mm -hmm. that much slower. Mm -hmm. um, and so the federal government has been, you know, generous in allowing us to move ahead with this program. But we have moved ahead as a uh, mom and pop operation, and have been lucky. And so it has worked. It has been something that we've not had to go through 15 different vaccines, or as pharma companies often do hundreds of different vaccines or formulations. And we have been a willing to settle for partial responses, whereas the large pharma companies always want a blockbuster. All right, well, so how far along is it? In other words, so you now have the adjuvant and has it actually, you've studied it in humans and it looks promising. We've not studied the new adjuvant, adjuvanated vaccine in humans. We hope in the next year or two to get FDA approval. Okay. We're just beginning the toxicology studies now with it, but there's no surprises that we expect because the basic vaccine has remained the same. It's a cocaine attached to uh, tetanus toxoid rather than cholera toxin, which was the carrier we used before. Mm -hmm. And the adjuvant, while it has one of them that we're thinking of using, has not been in people. It's had extensive uh, toxicology testing already in various species of animals, including primates. Mm -hmm and was developed by a company that got bought out. And so the company that bought them is not interested in the adjuvant, but has been willing to donate it to us, which is a company called Esai, which is a Japanese company. So those vaccines we hope to develop in the United States in the, the methamphetamine and the cocaine vaccine. Within the next two years, these new second generation vaccines to go into people um, and then hopefully move along a lot quicker than the 20 years it took us up to this point yeah. because we have a lot of uh, preliminary data, a lot of experience with the FDA, and um, our expectations, because there are no other FDA-approved medications for these conditions, are the FDA will give us a um, opportunity to get approval with many fewer subjects than the thousands and thousands of subjects they typically require for yeah. other kinds of vaccines. Well, one would hope that would happen. I mean, it's so interesting to hear you describe this. I mean, from a big picture point of view, this is an enormous public health problem that you'd think that also could be an opportunity for industry um, to 
at least in the early phase when something is patented, be able to make money on it. But it's big bucks to invest in a gamble that you don't know until you test it um, for sure. Well, certainly you, you wouldn't know very well, and the, the pharmaceutical companies have gotten more and more cautious about what they want to invest in, particularly anything that has to do with brain disorders, as we well know, as many of them have gotten out of the brain disorders. But this vaccine has now been you know, up to phase three testing. Uh, that is a, a point at which, if this was any other medication, we would have every pharmaceutical company in the, in the world wanting to buy it from us and license it from us because it's pretty well proven mm -hmm. that it can work. Um, the difficulty is stigma of this particular population. The other difficulty is who's going to buy the medication. These are patients often who are indigent. Yeah. and the, the buyer will be the federal government or state government and they're going to negotiate a price with these pharmaceutical companies that might be not as profitable as they would like. Yeah, well, those are the, that's interesting, and those are dynamics that don't always apply in other kinds of medication development. But, mm, not of course, all. the addictive problem is not limited to those who are indigent or in the low-income stratum. Precisely, which we have um, been successful at convincing them around the nicotine issue, and they've projected that the nicotine vaccine will be approximately two to three billion dollar market. Wow. So, which is why they're all interested in developing them now. Yes, indeed. Well, we never have enough time and we're about out of it at this point, but let's circle back to that. So I, I think it's fabulous that you are back where you are with regard to the cocaine development, because that is so critical. And I just hope, like hell, this really works out for you. So do I, thank I you very you much. And so, but the closest to prime time release, I guess, is the nicotine vaccine is that fair to say? Um, ironically, the cocaine vaccine might come out before, oh, even really? though it's so far behind in many ways. And the reason is cocaine has no treatments available or FDA approved. So the bar for demonstrating efficacy and safety are considerably lower mm -hmm. than for nicotine treatments where there's a fairly wide variety of treatments out there. And you have to show that your treatment is not only different from them, which the vaccines clearly are, but at least as good as them. Yeah. And those usually well, require yeah. one-year outcome yeah. data, which is very hard to collect yeah. <laughs> and very expensive to yeah. collect. Yeah. Um, so we can get things approved potentially with six to eight week trials, which are significantly easier to come by. Uh, that, that's a significant difference. I, that, that's a very good point. I hadn't really thought of it that way. So you, you've got treatments that work uh, for nicotine, but really... A bigger hurdle that's going to have to be overcome. Yeah. And the, thus far, the FDA have treated us um, Wild West um, individual investigator characters a little bit more kindly than they treat Pfizer. And so we don't have quite the high bar of, um, of uh, data on efficacy that one has to demonstrate if you're Pfizer. Well, let's hope it stays that way and yes. gets even better. Ah, uh, nothing would be please me more. <laughs> Thanks, John. But thank you for your fortitude and your perseverance because it has taken a lot of both, it sounds to me like. You have to be, have a very high frustration tolerance. Yes, yes right. <laughs> and you must. Uh, to a certain extent, although if you ask my wife, she might say something different. Well, we won't ask. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for joining us, Tom. This was very interesting. And thank you all for joining us again. And we'll see you next time.